Hello, everyone. My name is Daryl. Saunders, and on behalf of the Atlantic Salmon Conservation Foundation, I'd like to welcome you to today's webinar. This series is made possible in part thanks to the contributions of the Government of Canada. For today's webinar, we're very pleased to be hosting Sam Reeves. Sam coordinates the Blue Nose Coastal Action Foundation's La Have River Watershed Project and has been involved in fish habitat restoration projects for the past four years. Growing up in Lunenburg County, Sam has spent countless hours on the La Have and is very passionate about protecting the river's Atlantic salmon population. After the presentation, we'll be opening the floor for a question and answer session, and you'll have the option of asking questions directly using your microphone, or you can type them in and we'll read them aloud. I will now turn the webinar over to Sam. Thank you, Darla. Um... As Daryl mentioned, my name is Sam Reeves. I'm the Watershed and Agricultural Project Coordinator for Coastal Action. Um, and today I'll just be uh, describing um, a bit about what we do in regards to fish habitat restoration on the La Have. Uh, so I'll get started. Um, just a bit of a presentation overview. I'll do a quick chat about uh, the Coastal Action Organization. Uh, I'll do a quick talk about Atlantic salmon in the La Have. I'll talk about how we divide the watershed, how we prioritize sites, um, assessing streams, how we restore habitat, um, and then move into assessing culverts, uh, restoring fish passage, uh, some of the large scale restoration projects that we've done, and some of the future work we plan to do. Uh, so a little bit about coastal action. Uh, the Blue Nose Coastal Action Foundation is a charitable organization. Uh, we address environmental concerns on the social region of Nova Scotia. We were established in December of 1993. Our goal is to promote restoration, enhancement, and conservation of our ecosystem through research, education, and action. Uh, we are involved in many environmental projects, including species at risk, watershed base, and environmental education projects. Uh, we receive direction from a volunteer board of directors and are supported through a full-time executive director. Uh, just a quick couple of examples of some of the specific projects we do. Uh, we do an American EO monitoring project in the East River. Um, we do an Atlantic whitefish recovery project. Um, we do, as it mentions, many uh, environmental education projects. We do a variety of summer camps for kids where kids get out and you know learn about the forests and ecosystems and all that great stuff. Uh, so a bit about Atlantic salmon in the La Have. Um, the La Have is considered an index river by uh, DFO Canada, uh, and it plays an important role in estimating salmon populations in the southern upland region of the province. Um, each year, adult salmon and small are recorded at Morgan Falls Fishway, which is located in New Germany. Um, in past years, the river ha has uh, supported healthy populations of salmon, and in 1988 it was estimated there was 4,000 salmon traveling through the river. Uh, more recently, the numbers have decreased to less than 200 adult salmon returning to Morgan Falls each year. Uh, it is important to note that um, there was a uh, small enhancement program that ran from 1971 to 2003 so that high number in 1998, 1988, sorry, would have been somewhat influenced by that. But, uh, I've also supplied a graph there um, that kind of shows salmon populations over the years and, and how they've dropped. Uh, so dividing the watershed. So the Have is uh, one of the largest watersheds uh, this side of the province. Um, so in order to kind of tackle it, we divide it into si six separate wa sub watersheds. Sorry. Um, and this allows us to better plan and execute annual restoration activities throughout the entire watershed. Um, and for each sub watershed, we create sub watershed fish habitat restoration plans. Uh, and these highlight land use, uh, potential restoration sites and background information pertaining to each of the sub watersheds. Um, so prioritizing sites. Uh, so this is a great way to ensure you're getting the most of your effort, especially when you're working in a watershed that is uh, as big as the Lahave. Uh, so we 
prioritize sites and especially culverts mainly through, through GIS mapping. Uh, so just by combining stream, road, and land use layers, uh, we can identify both stream crossings and key areas to assess. Um, so the map you'll see there, uh, this is one of our culvert um, maps. Uh, this is the main branch. The red line sh shows the outline of the, uh, the sub-watershed itself. And each of those triangle icons uh, show crossings that we've identified. Um, the yellow would be partial barrier. Green would be no barrier and the reds are barriers and any um, purple triangles are ones that we haven't been able to assess as of yet. Um, so assessing streams. So we typically aim to assess three to five tributaries each field season. Uh, we use our own stream assessment protocol, which in involves recording the following characteristics. So we just take coordinates of the sites. Uh, we look at features of the right and left bank. So this includes um, the forest type, what kind of trees are present. Uh, we especially note any uh, anthropogenic uh, issues such as uh, roads or, or if we come across the shale pits or anything like that. Uh, we take recordings of water depth, uh, shade as percentage. We look at what inverts are present just by doing rock grabs. Uh, we look at the substrate composition, we break it down into bedrock, cobble, gravel, fines, um, and we do a repairing help assessment. Uh, this is based on a protocol that was created by the province, uh, and then we usually take water quality readings with our YSI. Um, so restoring habitat. So we have completed many restoration projects and have been successful using several different methods. Uh, the most common forms that we use include digger logs, deflectors. Uh, we do some repairing planting and we've also done some step pools. Uh, the photo you'll see here uh, is a deflector digger log combination that we did in a tributary to the West River um, of the Lahave. Uh, a couple more examples of restoration that we've done. Um, on the left there, you'll see a picture of a, of a site that we did some planting. This was an old uh, decommissioned road where a bridge had collapsed into the river and was uh, acting as a barrier to any fish migrating. So we were able to clear that material out of the stream and then plant along the banks where the, the road had passed over the stream. Um, and then on the right side, you'll see step pools. This is a tributary of the Lahave um, that we worked on this summer. We were hoping to do digger logs, but the, the large substrate and uh, especially the bedrock present didn't allow for this. So uh, with the help of uh, Amy West and uh, NSLC adopt the stream, uh, we laid out some, some step pools. Uh, so we we're basically, we basically removed a lot of the lot larger substrate uh, and were able to deepen the pools and, uh, and get a much more defined channel. Um, this stream uh, was quite shallow during the summer months and, uh, and was not, certainly not ideal for, for any fish using it. So. Assessing culverts. Um, over the past three years, we have assessed over 100 culverts throughout the watershed. Uh, many of which were determined to be acting as barriers to fish, fish passage. Uh, we, uh, we completed our assessments using protocol completed, created by the Nova Scotia Salmon Association and Clean Annapolis River Project. Um, sorry, I'm just going to go back to that slide for a second. So uh, basically when we do a uh, culvert assessment, uh, we, we get an idea of what slope the culvert is sitting at. So uh, just depending on what species is migrating through that stream, um, a slope higher than 0.5% can, can act as a barrier to some fish. Um, anything over 2.5% uh, is considered a full barrier uh, to, to, to all fish. Um, although we know that some trout and salmon can, can pass through those culverts. Um, so to restore that, uh, we 
we've we just started really looking at uh, aquatic connectivity a few years ago and we've been able to restore passage to over 25 culverts um, so typically they just require uh, what we call a weir and a shoot combination which you'll see in the picture there uh, so basically that culvert um, had four by four on either side uh, and when the water was low there was absolutely no flow going through there so what we did is we added another four by four on top and then put a chute in the middle. And uh, this allowed for uh, the water to be more channelized and creates a nice little uh, slide there for fish to, to go in and then continue past the culvert on the other side. Um, so this is uh, Wagner Brook. This is uh, one of the a major tributary to the Lahave. It flows into the to the estuary, so the uh, upper section of the Lahave towards uh, towards the ocean. Um, as you can see, it's quite a large culvert. Uh, so we worked with Adopt Stream on this culvert as well. And uh, basically, what you'll see is a series of baffles. We basically cut the culvert in two. Uh, we have a series of baffles that uh, slow the water up and channel it on that single side and then the water is uh is blocked off on, on this other side here to to send most of the water through the baffle section and then on the downstream side you'll see uh you'll see the chute there and and the weir that we created uh, so this is uh one of the methods of, of restoring larger wide culverts like this uh so before this the, before we would have installed these structures uh there, you can see there's a bit of an outflow, there would have been a bit of an outflow drop and, and the water was quite shallow in that culvert. So it uh, was certainly acting as a, as a barrier of fish passage for uh, most part of the year. Uh, so these are a couple other culvert restorations that we've done. Um, on the left there, you'll see, uh, this is our, our, this was our first, um, example of using concrete as baffles to restore a culvert. Uh, so this basically involved redirecting the water around the culvert and creating a series of molds to uh, pour the concrete in and uh, and then installing a chute on the other side. <clears throat> so these these concrete baffles have held up extremely well, um, especially compared to the lumber which um, takes quite a, quite a beating during the spring the, the spring floods and, uh, and, and and the ice coming down um, during the w winter melts. So, and then on the right, you'll see me. That's me just installing a, a simple chute uh, that was designed specifically for that culvert. Uh, so these basically back the water up and increase depth in the culvert, and, and also give a, a nice little slide there for fish to to enter the culvert and uh, make their way up through. Uh, so a couple of the large scale restoration projects that we've completed. Uh, this is Roadnizer Lake. Uh, it's also in the, the upper sections of the Little Have, which flows in, in near the estuary. Um, there's a dam to the left there. It's a bit hard to see, but uh, so this lake had been dammed historically in the past and the dam is still present and is acting as a barrier to any fish uh, wanting to come up into the lake. So what we did is uh, we worked with East Coast Aquatics and Adopt Stream on this project to uh, to create a channel going around the dam. Um, here's a picture of, uh, of a bit of the excavating that was done um, as we were creating the channel going around uh, and the final product. Uh, so this opened up a nice uh, channel and and. It was created using, you know, we, we surveyed the, the whole stretch to ensure that the slope was correct and each drop between the pools, uh, it's, it's kind of a bit, of, it's a step pool habitat coming down through the channel. Um, so we wanted to ensure that it would certainly pass fish even during low flow. So uh, it was all taken into consideration. And then uh, this is another one of our larger scale projects. This was done in 2017. Uh, so as you can see here, this is in a, a section of pasture and a farm. Uh, this stream flows into one of the, the major tributaries in the Lahave. <coughs> uh, 
and uh, the cattle had been crossing the stream and it's uh, it was severely degraded as you can see there was a lot of sedimentation happening and uh, so we, we again work with the Doppler stream on this project to um, create a crossing for the cattle first off we did a fish rescue and we actually were able to relocate over 500 native fish out of that small section and this included you know, white sucker, creek chub, uh, we did see some brook trout. Unfortunately, we didn't see any salmon at that time, but we do know that salmon are using the, the tributary with, with this, this uh, stream connects to. Um, so after the fish rescue was done, we, uh, we cleared up the rest of the water in there and uh, we had an excavator uh, set the culvert in place. Again, at the correct slope, uh, we, we surveyed the site first. And, uh, and then once the culvert was installed, uh, we spread a lot of hay over and, um, and yeah, there's, there's now a, a great crossing there for, for, for the cattle using it. And I've personally seen the cattle use it and, uh, and the area on the, the downstream side here was fenced off to, uh, ensure that cattle were not accessing the, the stream anymore. So. Yeah, so uh, some of the future work that we that we hope to complete, uh, we hope to continue completing projects such as the ones I've, I've just described in this presentation in, in years to come. Um, in 2019, we, we plan to identify key areas throughout the watershed that the remaining salmon are using. Uh, as I've mentioned, it's, it's a large watershed and it's been quite difficult to to really identify those those areas that the, the salmon are using. So uh, we plan to do uh, lots of electrofishing and uh, and species analysis to to really identify those key tributaries and uh, and uh, see if there's anything there that needs to be done and, and ensure those areas are protected. Uh, and that goes towards our overall goal of ensuring that returning salmon have access to to nursery streams that are that these areas and that these areas are functioning properly for for them to re reproduce successfully. Uh, so that pretty much uh, wraps things up for the presentation. Uh, I can take any questions now. Thank you very much, Sam. Um, so as I mentioned in the intro, folks have a couple of options for asking questions. Um, you can either figuratively raise your hand using the um, yellow hand icon, um, and we'll unmute you so you can ask your question, or you can also type it in on the control panel and we'll read it aloud for you. So we do have an expression of thanks from Colin Murray that has just come in. Maybe we'll give folks a few minutes to uh, organize themselves in terms of questions. Um, I guess while we're waiting for folks, Sam, I did have one question. So you showed a number of examples of um, shoot installations that you've used at culverts to remediate yeah. um, passage issues. I'm wondering what sort of follow-up has happened with you or with other groups that you might be aware of to see how those are those are being used. Um, would you be referring to, you know, actually watching to see if fish are physically using them or? Or, or you know, electrofishing surveys um, mm -hmm. before and after or any sort of follow up to find out um, how how they might be, how they might be functioning. Right. Um, so we haven't done any physical restoration. I know that uh, Adopt the Stream has many videos of, of you know, Gasparo and, and Trout using these shoots um in in areas where they they wouldn't have been able to pass uh we do um other than that i i can't really think of any examples uh there there are you know we do do some we have done similar work in the petite river and uh we do gaspro counts each year at uh, one of the fishways on the, on head dam and uh there may be correlation there, but we, we haven't really looked at it, so. Okay, 
Um, I've got a couple of other questions that have come in. Uh, Sarah Wheatley uh, writes, in PEI, cows are legally required to be fenced out of streams. Uh, is there any effort to do something similar in other provinces like Nova Scotia? Uh, so actually, I recently spent some time in Newfoundland uh, talking about uh, water watershed projects relating to agriculture, and it it seemed that there uh, it was similar to PEI in that uh, the farmers were required to you know uh, keep a buffer between their activities and and streams. Um, I find that here in Nova Scotia, uh, the regulations are, are quite poor and and need to be reviewed um, because there are there are numerous um, examples of, of where I see cattle accessing streams and it's uh, you know it, it, it's impacting the, the fish and it's also um, impacting the water quality for the for the cattle using it when uh, there's so much sediment stirred up and the, and the cattle are defecating in the stream so it's uh, it's certainly an issue that uh, that needs to be looked at here in Nova Scotia and I think on the, certainly on a on a provincial and federal government uh, level. Thank you. Uh, the next question comes from Chris, Christopher Newell, who asks, uh, "Could we get some detail on the creation of step pools? What are the characteristics of the ideal site?" Right. Um, so, so as I mentioned in this, the, the step pools that we did this summer. Uh, the substrate was uh, was a combination of bedrock and and boulder, um, and this this area was on uh, a fairly steep slope, uh, so the stream was flowing fairly quickly. Um, and based on what what I understood from Amy Weston of Adopt Stream, uh, it's it's very difficult to put digger logs in these areas. So. Uh, Basically, anywhere where you have uh, a fast drainage and, and a steep slope, and, and you have the appropriate uh, substrate, uh, you can incorporate these step pools. Which basically, you just you you don't want it when you're done. You don't want it to look like it's been um, it's been really created by humans. You just you want to ensure that you keep the natural flow of the stream. Uh, you want to try to keep that left to right pool ratio. And, uh, and and you can build up the, the, the tail water control of the pools a bit, but you kind of, we, we tried to leave it as much as we could. Um, so yeah, so basically you just go in and, and remove as much of that larger substrate as you can and, and try to deepen the pools as much as you can with the, without going overboard. And, uh, and, and we're excited to see how those pools uh, Hold out during the winter, and 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 uh, we did do electrofishing, uh, uh, pre-site electrofishing before we started. So uh, we plan to go back and visit that site next year to see um, if if the species composition changes at all, if the if the size of the fish that were present changes at all. We we did see a lot of really healthy brook trout par in that area where we did the step pools. So uh, it'll be interesting to see if, if there's any changes there. Thank you. Um, I've got a couple of questions from Jessica Chan about the shoots. Um, uh, the first question is, is there any maintenance required for the shoots? A need to clear debris from the culverts, for example? Yeah, so so we've uh, gone back each year and, and checked on these shoots and they can certainly catch sticks and leaves and stuff, but it, it takes only a couple seconds to clear that out. Um, other than that, if they're installed correctly, uh, they they really hold up well in, in high high flow conditions and and during uh, that that winter melt when the ice is coming down. So uh, the shoots really have minimal uh, maintenance requirements. Uh, the wooden baffles, on the other hand, as I mentioned, uh, one of the in the Wagner culvert that we uh, did repairs to this year, that the uh, some of those four by fours had just been cleared out uh, during the during the heavy uh, spring melt. So, uh, yeah. Um, and her follow up question is: When would you install a shoot to the culvert versus using an open bottom culvert? Um, so open bottom culverts are, uh, I'm assuming she means natural bottom there, or she or I'm not, 
I'm not sure. Okay, so yeah, she um, says yes. She says yes, okay. she is. Yeah. Open bottom culverts are always ideal if if there is funding available to replace a culvert with an open bottom, then uh, that is certainly the best method. Um, however, these shoots are, are quite cost efficient. They only cost about two to three hundred dollars, uh, depending on the size to to have made, and and they're they're quite easy to install. So, uh, uh, yeah, open bottom would certainly be ideal. But these shoots are are quite effective, um, especially in the in the circular metal culverts and and the uh, and the uh, concrete box or wooden box culverts.